All right, Don, what is tonight's topic? All right, let's talk about joints. Everybody gets a lot of these joints messed up. A box joint is a square cut on the corner, and it's not necessary. A lot of people use them. Uh, I've had people send me emails and that. Uh, finger joints, I've never, hardly ever seen finger joints in a beehive. They're usually used for like jewelry boxes and small boxes, wooden boxes. And dovetail is almost an obsolete, type. that's usually for drawers. But people are spending too much time making these joints. I use a rabbit joint myself. Uh, you can put a rabbit joint in so much faster. Four, hand, four uh, sides or four handles on a, uh, the, the rabbit joint. It takes about 15 to 20 seconds where a box joint, you have to set your jig up. And if you get any swelling of wood, it's going to pop out on you. I mean, there was a guy that bought some stuff and had it on my web page. Uh, you got on the corner, you got, it looks like this. You got four corners. You got twice the end grain exposed to weather. Uh, when I first started beekeeping, that's about the only way you could buy boxes, but they don't hold up as good. I've got rabbited joints out there that's been out there. Uh, some of those boxes, 25, 28 years old. And I can date them because I stopped branding back then. And I do not use any glue of any kind on frames or boxes because, you know, you might have a bad box of one corner. If you take a box and you rock it back and forth, you can pop the staples out and you could use three sides of it, especially if you're picking the box up the wrong way. That's why they have handles, but people reaching across the frame rest, and you've got a thin 3 8 piece that goes across there, and that's the weakest part of that box. And that's where they break it. Uh, that's why I put handles in. And I like a dado blade to put the handles in the box. If you attach a piece of wood as a handle, wherever you've got the wood separated and you put it back together with glue or screws or staples, it'll rot out on the back side of it. That's why we use a dado joint. Now, <clears throat> we have some pictures of wax being boiled. Uh, wax cleaning is the simplest thing if you don't overcrowd the pot. I use a 20-quart kettle, and I fill it three-quarters of the way full of water, and I don't use any more than three to four deep frames at one time, especially if you got a lot of cocoons. And then once you bring it to a boil and you stir it a little bit, make sure all your wax is melted, then pour it through a strainer and use your high tool and press it and just keep rotating it in the screen. That's going to get, and then put it in either a two gallon or a five gallon bucket and don't mess with it. Just let it sit. The next morning, it'll be one nice clump and you can take your fingers and rub the bottom and get all that dirt off of it. And what doesn't come off will be propolis. If you want to get it off, you can scrape it off. Uh, people that's ordered bees from us, I know I'm getting tons of calls wanting to know when they're going to get bees. We have not been able to get into most of our bee yards. In fact, my son got stuck. He's got four-wheel drive. I've got two inches of water on my property here, and it's been on there for like three weeks. This is the wettest season that I've seen. And our bees from Athens down south, and we got some lower, once you get down below the fall line in Georgia, that is where the ocean used to be hundreds of years ago. So it's naturally wetter there. There's five to six inches of water in a lot of our bee yards down there. So uh, we'll get our bees out and we'll get our nukes out as soon as we can. Uh, if you get impatient and you want a refund, we'll give you a refund. I mean, we got tons of people wanting bees, and I wish we could produce them a lot faster. But this is going to be a really wet season. And if it don't straighten out, a lot of people is going to end up losing bees. Uh, people that's got dry enough weather already getting swarms, which is a little uh, too early, I think, for getting swarms. But they're actually, you know, populating good. Uh, I'm, I'm still doing classes, commercial bee classes. I'm doing one day classes and I, I'm going to start taking volunteers. Anybody wants to come up, hang out and they're going to feed bees. They're going to do a little maintenance work and stuff. 
and they can swap out that for taking lessons, hanging around. Uh, and then, uh, see, oh, and uh, we'll start classes probably mid March to the end of March. Uh, I try to get uh, the older students in and get them working first because the new students, I try to get all those grouped together on one or two days because you go through a lot of the basic stuff. And uh, a lot of people don't understand terminology on beehives because I get people calling and they want to buy racks or they want to buy nuts, all kinds of stuff. A, a nucleus is a, a nuke is a nucleus. It's a center of a hive is basically what it is. And a rack is what you bake on. A frame is what you put in a beehive. And I have people calling and asking these strange things, and I'm getting an education on, on terminology. But <clears throat> let's get to our questions, because I had a lot, a lot of people didn't get a chance to get uh, the questions and stuff they wanted to get answered last time. And I know they had a lot of B withdrawals, because I get emails. When's the next one? All right, first up is Paul. Go ahead, Paul. Your microphone is not working at all. Louder. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the pictures on, on your Facebook page, but I lost quite a few hives. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. And, you know, I, I was just thinking, I don't know, those hives were packed with bees. I mean, literally overflowing. You know, I don't know if I went through winter, if I should have split them before winter, but there was just so many bees in there, and I don't know what the hell happened. I don't know. I could have been it starved out on you. You know what? It, there's, there was plenty of honey in there. It just did, it seemed like they, they just moved up. They didn't move out. Did you treat them? I treated them, but I didn't treat them enough. Well, the main thing, if you're if you don't want to do any treating at all, and you want to at least treat treat August, September, October, and November, and even in December if the bees are flying. Uh, the last three months of the year is really important. If you do no other treatment, uh, there's people that want to stay treatment free of any kind. I mean, you can do that, but you're going to have to break that mite cycle, make a lot of splits. That's one way. But I personally looked at those hives that you had on there. I would have split them things a dozen times because that's what we have to do in commercial business. You have to play the numbers. You have to do a lot of splits and hope if you, at the worst, if you lose half, you still come out ahead. So it's better to lose a, a smaller hive than a big packed up hive. Yeah. I, I had some ventilation issues as well. And um, well, I tell you, this year I learned a lot on how to, uh, on how to handle the bees. You know, this year I just got to build my numbers back up, like you said. Yeah. I got to do a lot of splits. And uh, it's like you said, you want to go through winter. I'd rather go through winter with a lot of hives. And even if you have 50% loss, at least your numbers are still up there. A lot of people that I've been, you know, kind of teaching and giving them advice and stuff, they have learned over the last, since 95, I guess, that five frame nukes in the north go through winter a lot better than a 10 frame double or triple. I mean, it's just, you got more bees in there and everything, but you can compact them down to a nuke and they do better. So we try to do that in September. Split up is all we can. Numbers go through the winter a lot better. I tell you, I'm even thinking of switching back to just the regular 10, uh, one, one uh, 10 frame deep for a brood box than two double deeps. I mean, do you really think there's an advantage over that? It depends on what you're trying to do. You know, you know my advice to someone, you know, if they're making honey, they want big, strong hives. Uh, what we don't want to run really strong hives. The hives that we run in double eights, we basically are using those to shake packages off. But if you're going to run honey, you're running that borderline of swarming all the time. Because if the hive is not in the process of almost swarming with that number of bees packed, you're not making a good honey crop because your honey is only going to come in for a short period of time. So you have to have a lot of bees where, you know, I would take that same hive and split it, you know, 15, 20 times and I'll go through the, the winter with numbers. 
they're all going to make honey. Uh, it just depends on what your goal is. Yeah. It's I something you have to sit down and figure out what's going to work for you. You know, like people ask advice, should I pollinate? Should I make honey? Should I do this? You've got to experiment around what you like to do and what is going to work for you. I mean, I wouldn't put all my eggs in one basket. I would do some, you know, if you want to get into pollinating, do a small amount and see how you're going to like it. Because bees are not going to be healthy when they come out of pollinating. I'll guarantee that. I ordered some packages and um, I want to split those packages into two. You know, I ordered some queens with them as well. Yeah. So, I, you know, I got plenty of honey, plenty of frames of pollen. So I think they should do all right in the beginning without, you know, without even feeding them. How are you going to split your packages? Are you going to put them in five frame nuke boxes? I have um, four frame double nukes. Four frame double nukes. So you've got an eight frame box, so you've got four frames on each side. Yeah, I have a 10 frame with four oh. frames on each oh, side. Oh, okay. Uh, you, you know, personally, I would go smaller. I've got five frame boxes. We built out 50 of the other day, um, and they're a five frame standard box with a divider in the middle with a political sign. That gives you two frames on each side. And if you, in fact, I talked about it on the last chat. If you dump a package in there, get an extra queen and put a queen on each side and just dump the package across and move them back and forth with your hive tool and let them go down. Or if you've got ripe queen cells, put a queen cell on each side. That works good. Uh, that's the preferred method I like. You know, I don't like to put a queen in the box unless it's a, you know, I'm setting up a new hive. So if I have all drawn out frames, how long do you think it would take to move them into a bigger box? At least that, three weeks. That would depend on your weather and how you're feeding them, you know. Uh, four frames, you know, they should build out pretty good if you already got to draw it out. I mean, you're going to take three days for the queen to get out, four days on the outside. So, you know, you got, say, another 10 days there, you should be able to put them in another box. Yeah. But wait until it's warm enough weather. Well, it would be it would be at least three weeks before they start hatching out. So, well, if you're waiting till they hatch out, then you're gonna have to wait three weeks. But if you want to make that split, you know. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Don. Okay. Okay. Over to Henry. Go ahead, Henry. Hey, Don. Hey. <clears throat> First of all, I apologize for eating in front of you all, but but when dinner's ready, I eat. So <laughs> that's it. Um, <clears throat> question is. <clears throat> I know you don't use uh, glue, but you also use an air gun. Right. For me, what kind of, that doesn't have that equipment, what, what kind of nails do you use? I use staples on my frames and my boxes. The only place I use brads is on the wedge bar on frames. I use a 5 8 brad there. But on, if you can shoot straight, uh, a 7 16 staple, I mean, I used them in the past, but they cost a lot more 7 16 staples, uh, eight, a 16 gauge than the 18 gauge quarter crown. If you use an inch and a quarter or an inch and a half uh, quarter crown, it's more than enough. I guarantee it, you're not going to pull the frame apart. Okay, but I don't have an air gun. <clears throat> So it's the best investment you can spend. It's the best twenty dollars you'll ever spend. Well, then plus, of course, the compressor. So, total a hundred bucks. No, I mean Harbor Freight runs. They got a, what they call a pancake uh, compressor. Uh -huh. I got that, and I got a full size DeBelvis air compressor, which runs a lot. I mean, it's but the small one I can carry it out in my bee yard. When we load packages on trucks, I'll take that pancake out there and we'll load out packages on someone's truck or trailer with it because it's, it's more mobile. And if I'm working in the basement, I can carry it downstairs. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, they got I those for $38. Want to Pardon? They have them for $38 at Harbor Freight. Oh really? Okay. Yep. They're they're not the greatest, but they'll they'll get you by. And that twenty dollar gun, I've had people bring Lowe's gun up here, Bostit guns, you know, and different brands. And I've got a lot of the Harbor Freight stuff, and it it, it works good. I mean, if you get six months out of those tools, you got your money's worth. I've got one downstairs I've had for five years. Uh, the newer ones coming out, they don't seem to hold up as good. 
especially if you're using hardwoods. The drivers go bad in them. They get rounded and they want they don't want to shoot start good. Okay. Okay, so you can use a one and a quarter inch quarter crown. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a box of those staples is around eleven dollars, I guess. Unless you buy them in bulk, you can get them for around eight dollars if you buy enough of them. The other ones are about seventy dollars a box. There's ten thousand in those boxes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not for my little pea picking kind of uh, business I have going on. Well, if you're I building a business, yeah, I'm just trying. If to you're building a lot of boxes, you go through them. Uh, those boxes that have ten thousand, the uh, seven sixteenths, uh, they're sixteen gauge. We buy usually 20 boxes at a time when we get our order. In the quarter crown, we usually buy 25 or 35 boxes of those. Good night. And we buy uh, one inch, we buy an inch and a quarter and inch and a half. And what would be the difference in them? I mean, what purpose well, do we use the different sizes? Well, we use some for, we put bottoms on, uh, you know, a solid bottom on a five frame box. And if we use a staple, we don't want it to go up in there far enough. It'll, uh, one inch will hold good. You can go like a half inch plywood and you can knock it back off. And see that when we build boxes, a lot of time people come buy 25 nukes or 30 nukes and they want to buy some more. So we'll put a bottom on a five frame box in there. We'll sell it in the box that way. <clears throat> and then when we load people's trailers out, you don't want a big long staple going through your cages. Right, right. You know, so it makes it a little, a little easier for them to take it apart. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, over to Bruce. Go ahead, Bruce. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, good to see everybody after a month and a half. Uh, I uh, got with Ant Ant Antler Ridge Beekeeping. Mm -hmm. And I got them to send me 40 of the uh, unassembled five frame boxes. Uh, they got finger finger grooves. They so want they box joints. finger joints. They box want joints. to, yep, they want to get, yeah, box joints. They want together smooth, that mm -hmm. uh, it was easy to put them together. They're only seven bucks a box unassembled. I know there's probably some other people out there that, that uh, manufacture uh, bee boxes unassembled, but for seven bucks a box, uh, you know, I, I can't build them any, uh, as that cheap. And I, I put them together with... Uh, he, with he was supposed to come last week and make a delivery, but he said he had a heart attack. Uh, <laughs> he, he was supposed to show up today. I called him and I didn't get an answer. He's supposed to bring... He's delivering us a thousand boxes. <laughs> well, so I guess I'm going to have to wait to get my, my next 100 boxes then. Oh, you didn't get them yet? No, I got 20, and I'm gonna, I reordered 100. <laughs> oh, oh. I did like the fact that they seem to be a little bit lighter than a regular number two pine that I use. Mm -hmm. I mean, weight means everything to me now. Yeah. Uh, bottom boards. I got a question for you, Don, on bottom boards. Do you really have to use a three-quarter inch sheet of, of, of uh, wood? Can, can you not use a, a three-eighth sheet of plywood uh, uh, or, or marine wood? Uh, for for the uh, for the bottom part of the bottom board because it makes it lighter. Well, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're moving your hives and everything. Now, I like a standard bottom board where you take the sides and you rabbit it out for the size of plywood you're using. Now, my son is doing just a little different because it's everything is time related. He's cutting three quarter by three quarter strips and he's just putting the plywood down and he's putting a strip around it. Now he's using three quarter uh, underlayment or he's using Advantech. Now the smallest you can go on the bottom would be half inch, but you're gonna have to put a piece of uh, wood underneath in the middle and on each end. Or you, if you don't do that, it's gonna bow up on you. It's gonna curl. Even on the bottom? On the bottom. Okay, I mean, I, I got Advantech for tops, uh, I get it. Mm -hmm. I don't want yeah. anything to warp, but, but I mean, that stuff is heavy. Well, I mean, uh, we have probably 15 different guns out there in the shop out there. We have a one inch. Uh, it's, it was basically a roofing gun. It's a wide staple. It's an inch or an inch and a quarter wide. 
and it's seven eighths to an uh, inch and a quarter long. And we usually buy the one inch. Now we shoot staples in the bottom board and in each corner. That way our bottoms don't fall off when we move our boxes or our hives. Yeah, and again, I, I, I'm looking for light, at make these hive boxes as light as I can because like you said, I, I don't want to carry heavy stuff around. I'm getting right. too old. Lighter the better. Uh, one other thing, uh, I use a DeWalt uh, uh, staple gun, battery operated. Mm -hmm. Those things work great. It, it shoots the inch and a quarter crown. Uh, you, it, you don't have to get an air compressor. I, I don't have a, a place for an air compressor out in the middle of nowhere. And I also got a battery operated Brad gun that I put my frames together with. Those things work great. They constantly charging them up too, though. You know, everybody has got their own thing. There's one guy come here. He's got a gas powered one where you put a cartridge in it and that he, he can work out in the field with his. I usually work my guns right here at the shop or horse wherever my uh, air hose will reach. And we usually run a hundred foot on the air hose because sometimes people back up a trailer with a truck and, you know, the air hose won't go up so far. Well, last one, I give a shout out to Anthony. Uh, I, I sure think that's great that he's uh, uh, guiding, uh, I guess, Dr. Sammy there in, in uh, Thailand. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's pretty nice of him to do that and even to help with the translation, obviously. He's going to learn a lot from from a from a, a a doctor. That's all I got. Okay. Okay. Over to Big Luscious. Go <laughs> ahead, Mark. Hi, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to to say thank you first to Don for taking the time to speak to me when I stopped by a couple of weeks ago down there at the, at your uh, your bee yard, and I just want to tell any of you out there that are thinking about uh, taking a class with Don in the 45 minutes to an hour that we spent there, I probably learned more than I have on half of the chats here because it's, it's just so personal and he walks through the yard and as he sees something, he says something. And it's the stuff that, you know, unless Don was out walking through his yard, we couldn't possibly get those things here. And I've seen in some of his videos where he does that, that, uh, you know, he's walking through the yard and he sees something, he says something. And I, I just have to thank Don for taking the time to talk with me and, I am so looking forward to being able to go down there and take a class with Don because seriously, every time he turned around and saw something, he said something, or he, he asked a question of you to make you think about something. I, my time with him was worth more than I could ever have given him for that time. But I really think that if anybody has any questions about whether a class with him would be worth the money, I personally guarantee it. <laughs> so, and I'm sure Don does too, but I just, I just wanted to thank you for that. And, and to, again, just thank you for all of the knowledge that you uh, shared with me that day. And, and he was talking about the boxes. He, he, he pointed out one that was a branded box that he said was 30 years old. And yeah, it may need a little repair or a little bit of paint or something, but those are good boxes still as far as, you know, and maybe I think you had that one had like one bad side on it or something. Yeah. But, you know, just that, that knowledge and that, um, that ability to give you that perspective of years and also just this is what we've learned. This is what we changed. This is what we're doing next. I seriously, every minute there was something new you were learning, and I just really appreciate that. That's all I wanted to say. But thank you again, Don. Thank you. I don't have to pay for advertising. Enough, enough people do that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Over to Dennis. Go ahead, Dennis. Can you hear me, Don? Yep. Mm -hmm. I just missed out on where you all said you was getting nuke boxes. Uh, Antler Ridge is the last place that, well, see, I get contacts all over the place. And when I get a good deal, uh, there's two or three other people around that's building boxes. Uh, one guy, I'm not going to say his name, you know, my son got some boxes from him. I didn't particularly care for him. Uh, but I haven't seen Antler Ridge's boxes. I've got two or three students in different places and going by what they told me and what, you know, I ordered a thousand of them because we'll go through them in about three weeks, you know, so I'll be ordering more. But the product is good. It's just like when I'm teaching, you know, I probably put out too much information. I overload people too quick. I mean, I walk around the bee yard like a lot of people will, will tell you, you know, and, my my mind's going 90 miles an hour. My my mouth's going 100 to keep up with it. So you know, things you know that I just see every day, you know, amazes other people because they haven't seen it. 
But I think you'll be happy with them. I was just curious if they was cheap enough. I'm building my own. I've built about 400 this winter. Yeah. And I still have about eight, close to $9 a piece in them. Well, when I have students here, you know, other students has been here. I have a sawmill. I get about 90% of my logs free. But what is your time worth? And yeah. see, my son's doing the same thing. You know, I can buy them cheaper than I can stand out there and saw them. For what it takes yeah. time for me to saw them, start the loader up, put a log on there, saw them, stack them, or then take them over there. I can buy this stuff done because there's a lot of people that want to get their name out that I use their product. That's why I get samples from a lot of people. I mean, well, a lot of people think a thousand boxes is a lot, but you know, you probably know you, you got, you know, in the business that long, a thousand boxes don't last you a week or two. No, no. And I'm, I've got plenty right at the moment, but I thought, well, that kind of price, I might yeah. jump ahead, get a little farther ahead because mm -hmm. it's going to be a busy year. Time oh, yeah. is savings. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Over to George. Go ahead, George. Oh, hold on. There you go. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Going down to Don is, is, is really, you know, he, he's got so much to tell you, man. You, you can't take it all in fast enough, you know. <laughs> I guess I overwhelmed him too many things. He got back to the room and I like, couldn't even go to school. <laughs> it, it's just, it's just, the, the information is unbelievable. Oh, I think he froze up. <laughs> Still there, George? Mm. He, he probably has bad service. I was talking to him. He kept fading in and out and breaking yeah. up a lot. Okay. Over to Greg. Go ahead, Greg. Hey, Don. We're just about hey. uh, sold out on the stock that we're bringing up from your place up through uh, to Ohio and all that. I just want to say thanks for... Uh, Sending folks our way. They're getting a lot of phone calls, so appreciate that. I've got a question more on the resale side. Uh, mm -hmm. What you know, we're, we're, we're bringing lots of packages and nukes to folks, and uh, I've anticipated and, and we're buying some extra queens. What's what's your standard policy, or, or what do you do for your customers? I know sometimes they're gonna they're gonna make errors. They're gonna roll queens and kill them. What what do you typically do for folks, or what do you would recommend that I uh, consider doing for folks? Where even though they're made at Queens in a cage, if they're not laying, they're failing for whatever reason, you know, what, what kind of communication, what things should I, what kind of questions should I have for them? And then as far as policy goes, what would you recommend that I do uh, to it's, keep people happy? It's kind of hard on selling Queens uh, and packages. Now um, there's probably several students been here or people that's on here right now. What If you come up here and you buy 50 packages or 100 packages, what I normally will do, I'll take the package and I'll ask you, do you want to verify the queen or do you want to take them as is? And what I usually do is I'll bump them down, turn the package sideways, you can look in there and you can see the queen moving. Now that's all I can do uh, because you can't guarantee how the package is going to be installed. Now a nuke, I don't do no guarantees on a nuke. Uh, I will show you the nuke. I will show you the, the frames. You can see the brood in all stages. You can see the queen is running around in there. If you're not happy, I'll get you another box. When you hit the street, them are your bees. Because there's too many people that will buy bees from you that's got tinkeritis. They're new beekeepers, and they get in there the next day, and they just root through there as fast as they can, and they just – it looks like a tornado. So. Yeah. Uh, if you got a customer that's been buying bees for a long time and you have a queen that's bad, uh, I would replace it. Uh, you gotta, you gotta know your customers. Uh, people will try to pull the wool over in your eyes. Right. You know? I mean, uh, there's no way you can guarantee anything. You're dealing with livestock. I, I've never had a single problem with any of the queens that I've gotten from you in the past, but I know how, you know, uh, folks can sometimes be and so I'm trying to be uh, trying to think ahead and, and be fair uh, and, and try to plan for you know some of that uh, while knowing that you know that I could have the wool pulled over uh, but you know being that uh, I'm bringing all the stock up from you they're not queens from my yard so I don't just have a hundred queens that I'm sitting on to could ship one out to somebody 
if yeah. they say, hey, my queen's not laying, you know, what should I do? So it sounds like if it's a, a, a package policy, they're like with any, whether it's a hog or a bee, there, there's not really any guarantee on her performance. Right. Um, it, it, but if, if, if someone calls me and they've, you know, and they're, walk, or they're trying to talk me through it and it's been four weeks on a package and everyone's, you know, drawing comb and there's pollen in there and there's nectar and the queen is live and healthy and she's walking around and there's no eggs, that would probably be one of the rarer instances where then it would be a call up on me at, to replace it at my cost versus yeah, folks that's that are rolling. Something like killing that you have to do because there's no guarantee that when you get queens that, you know, because when you cage them, I mean, each person that picks a queen up is going to handle them different. And if they squeeze that abdomen just too much, they could stop that queen or damage the queen. I mean, you're dealing with livestock. Right. You know, in all the years that I've been selling bees, I had very few um, that I had to replace in packages okay. or nukes. Uh, we used to ship a lot of uh, nukes with, and we'd have people every once in a while call and say, the queen was dead. And until you catch on to what's doing, they'll buy a nuke and then say the queen's dead and you send them another queen and they make a split. Uh -huh. So what we done is whenever we ship a, a nuke, we cage the queen and we put the queen between the frames. And when I started doing that way back in the late seventies, never had a problem, but you know, that's why I don't try to, uh, be mean about it. I show them the queen and I tell them, if you don't like the color of the queen or you don't like the laying pattern, I will replace, get you another one. Cause we always, if someone's picking 25 nukes up, we always have at least five more. Cause you never know that they don't like the color or, or something happens, you know, that you can replace it. But there's people out there will try to skin you. Yep. Okay, good enough. Thanks for the help, Don. Okay. Okay, we got a lull. No questions coming in right now. Good. Keep on chatting, Don. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul's up. There we go, Paul. Don, so you would recommend like splitting the package into what, like maybe a two-frame mini new? No, what I usually do, we're we starting this year with a bunch of five-frame mediums and a bunch of five frame deeps with a divider in the middle. That way we can put a package in it and put a queen cell on each side. We have to build numbers really fast. So as soon as that queen hatches out and starts to lay, we can transfer it into a five frame box. Now, you know, that's, that would be your smartest thing because you've got two frames, you've got heat transfer one side of the box to the other, but you know, you still have to feed them. Now, now the only way you're gonna feed them is drill a hole in the lid and put a, a jar on it or a bucket or whatever you're going to feed them with. Say you put a, a frame of honey in there, you would still recommend feeding them? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Even though they have a, a full frame of honey, you would still feed yep. them syrup. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thanks. <laughs> Over to John. Go ahead, John. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, a question for you. I've done a pretty good job, I think, so far of treating for mites uh, with the oxalic acid. And tomorrow we're supposed to have a 60 degree day. Mm -hmm. And I figured maybe I'd shoot in there here in southeastern Pennsylvania, hit them one more time. Um, there's supposed to be a 55 mile an hour wind tomorrow. So my question is if I treat with the oxalic acid, are the bee, once I open it up, they like to come out of the hive. Will they fly in 55 mile an hour winds? Yeah, they'll come out. I mean, okay. Is when it worth the risk? If you're going to use oxalic acid, what you do is put the wand in there. You're using a wand, I, I take it. I have the Oxybape 110. Okay. Well, you can either close the front up with a uh, towel, an old t shirt, a sock, you know, a cotton sock. You got a hole drilled in the back. That is that how you're putting it in? I usually go in through the front. I have mouse uh, metal mouse guards on a little hole, so I kind of shoot in between. Yeah, them. well, you can do that. I mean, anytime bees is flying, you can. But if you've been treating them right along, you know, you might not have to treat them. Okay. So, it, it, I guess the, what I have is it worth the risk? Like, is there anything I can do other than overheat the hive? 
that would cause the bees to die or brood to die? If I killed all the brood that's in there, would they lay more brood? Yo, know, they'll lay brood, but you're not going to kill the brood, not with a 110. Okay. That, that there, it blows it in there, and there's no temperature in there. It's almost like, you know, smoking those uh, vaporizing cigarettes or electric cigarettes. Okay. All it's right. cool. All right, great. Well, thank you. That was my question. Mm -hmm. All right. Over to Virgil and Thunder. Let's see. Oh, hang on. There you go. I got it. Yeah, Don, on the, on the double frame or the double boxes when you put that divider down the middle mm -hmm. um and you said you're feeding do you put the queen excluder on the top of that then no you don't use a queen excluder on a five frame box no i'm saying when you're making two a double nuke no you you got that divider that comes up to the top of your box okay so you don't and if you're feeding well i guess you're feeding liquid aren't you yeah yeah because we, we had the candy boards on there i just wondered if i put them on well, the sugar, the liquid sugar, is what you're going to do to, for spring buildup. Your okay. dry sugar is usually for overwintering, you know, like when you put it on top of the hive. Now, yeah. the easiest way to do it is just cut your box. You can either cut a lid, a migratory lid, and just put you an inch and a half hole in the back on one side and, and, in, and on the front on the other side. That way you can use two jars or, or buckets, whatever you want. Okay, how, roughly, I know you can't tell me exactly, but roughly how long is it going to take to build that up to where we can put them in a five frame? Well, you only got two frames there now, you know, because it, basically it's made to, for mating queens and then let them get a start. Now, you can pull two frames out there and then move them to another a spot and then add some extra brood to it. Okay. I mean, See, whenever you're doing commercial beekeeping, you're doing things not quite what a lot of people read in the book. You might take those two frames out and put them in a five frame box and move them back on a stand 10 foot back and go to three different hives and pull one frame of hatching brood out of three different hives and put it in that box. And then they've got a really strong box right then. Okay. Well, I'm just going to keep following. I, we bought another 40 boxes here last week. So... Like I said, I went from three to 13 last summer, and we're going for 50 this summer. You'll make it easy. Start you stocking made up it with sugar. <laughs> you made it easy. You're the one that made it easy, because I would have never dreamed that you could do it. Never. Well, that, that's the thing I try to pe teach, you know, and preach all the time is it's common sense beekeeping. You know, it's just simple. The more complicated people make it, the harder it is people get it. And yeah, I've had a when you have people that are telling you it's working, you know you're doing something right. We've had a few of our Amish friends look at me like I've got horns coming out my head. And then when it turns around and it's working, it's like they're scratching their heads now. Yeah. Like, how did, how did it happen? Because they've been keeping bees for years. And, you know, I always turn to them for my information. And here now they're coming to ask us, how would you do this and why would you do that? Because mm -hmm. Don said so, that's why. Well, the thing is, that's why a lot of times people ask me a question. I have to know what is their goal. Do you want to make honey? I mean, you set boxes up totally different for honey. If you're going to pollinate, you set them up differently. If you're going to make bees and make numbers, you set them up different. Everything's got a different approach to it. And it's not a big secret. I've been preaching it for years. It's just people think it's strange and it's hard for people to grasp that knowledge there. I think that's because, like you said, everybody wants to put more into it because it can't be that simple. It just can't be, you know, it's not going to work if it's that easy. But well, you know, eventually we want to get up for, for the numbers in honey. But right now my goal is to get a lot of hives going and keep them going to where we can kind of settle in. And I know we've got enough and then take so many of them and make those are our honey hives. But right well, you, now, we're just going for bees. You can make a good living where you're at with it. You know, you just don't make mistakes. I mean, I learned the hard way in Ohio making the, the wrong mistake. Listen to the wrong people and getting bad advice. That's the worst thing. But you can make a living at it no matter where you're at. John's doing it up there in Pennsylvania, and he's probably a little colder than you are. So Yeah. Well, the, they came through that real bad cold spell. The one hive we lost, it was totally my fault. I mean, it was a, a late swarm, and I was going to put more feed in for them, and, and I didn't, and it was my fault. They starved. So.
So Well, if you get a late swarm, I mean, the best thing to do is go to another hive or rob a frame or two of brood out that's hatching and put it in there. Yeah, well, we did that. But it's like I said, it just things got away from us there at the end of the fall yeah. there. We just forgot. But at least yeah. I know it wasn't something I did wrong other than just being forgetful. I mean, everything else worked. Well, that's the good thing about these chats. I mean, you can ask questions in that. There's nothing wrong with a lot of books that they put out there. They probably got 5% of fact in there and 99% of fluff to, to make the book thicker. So you got a lot of reading to do and they, you think you're getting something. But yeah. it's not hard. It's hard work is the only thing, you know, about beekeeping. Yeah, getting out there and keeping on top of them. I did notice we really had to be on top of those nukes last year. I mean, they were just exploding at times. Yeah. That's the only thing about nukes. They, they grow so fast. So you could go out there and pull frames of brood out of them, you know, keep them under control. Yeah. Now, that's once you got do. five frames in there, you, why don't you put supers on there? You'll get honey that way, too. We did. We had a couple of them. I think I ended up with four, four super boxes. Well, I just put, kept putting deeps on, and they just kept filling them with honey. So yeah. we took some off of there. But we had enough, you know, to get them through the winter and – and thank goodness, but, and that cold weather didn't affect them at all. And we, you know, been lucky. We're just going to keep an eye on them now and make sure they got plenty of food till we get some pollen and stuff coming in, which is going to be a while yet. Well, they'll go faster than what you think it will. <laughs> got to keep, keep with them though. Yeah, we are, but thanks. Okay. Okay. Over to Patricia. Go ahead, Pat. Hey everybody. It's good to see everybody tonight. I wanted to go back to something Don talked about when we first got started tonight, knowing the names of your equipment. And something that I tell people is catalogs are great. I don't care what company you get them from. They're free. You can go online. Get them all to send you one. What, ma'am? Yeah, just don't buy anything, Leon says. But when you get ready to buy things online, the catalogs help because you can price compare between companies, whether they you know do free shipping or whatever. But Better Be has a section in here that shows you all the parts of a beehive. You don't have to buy a book, it's absolutely free. But one of the reasons that's helpful is on the Facebook page, when you ask for help, sometimes if you say my so-and-so's in the super, we assume that's your honey super, because that's what a super is. And so knowing the names of the equipment is really helpful, and Better Bees catalog is free, and the pictures are pretty. So that's, that's the only thing I had, thanks. Okay. And back up to Mark. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I, Don, I just want to go back to something you said. And this is, I don't remember if I heard this from you or if I heard it from somebody else. So I want to just kind of run it by you just for the verification. You talked about when you take uh, the two frames and put it into a five frame, mm -hmm. go grab frames out of two or three boxes. Now that's right. the key. I remember hearing somewhere that if you take just bees out of one hive and put them in there, they'll fight. But if you take from two or three hives, they don't fight. Is that? Well, right? it depends on, you know, there's a little thing that, you know, if you're leaving the adhering bees to the frame, then you got to descend them. Okay. Normally what we do is we shake the bees off. Okay. Or just bump them a little bit and you can kind of look at it. If you've been doing bees a long time, you can tell a field bee from a nurse bee and a frame that's got bees on it that's hatching a lot of them are just dusty look and they look like, you know, they just hatched out. You put them in, they're not going to fight. But if okay. you pull a frame out that's got a lot of field bees and stuff on, if you descent them by spraying them with the sugar water and maybe a little bit of, of vanilla, or you could use a little bit, maybe a drop or two of wintergreen, something to just throw the smell off. I mean, okay. then they blend. Okay. I mean, there's a lot, when it comes to blending hives, there's a whole different thing there. I mean, you can combine hives with newspaper, you can descend them, you can do individual frames. I mean, there's so many different ways. You just, it's basically the beekeeper and your knowledge is basically what it is. Okay, I just, I remember hearing somewhere when they were talking about shaking, like even shaking bees mm -hmm. uh, to help out with the hive, they always said, make sure you shake more than just one hive's bees in because if it's just one hive and another they'll fight but if there's more than that they'll they'll do better and that's why I just wanted to ask that question while I had it on my head 
Well, the, the question or the, the, the response you just made, shaking bees, in, you know, if a, a new beekeeper is listening to that, they assume you take a frame and go to another hive and shake them in. You can end up killing the queen that way. That's why that little detail, you got to descend them. Now, you can smoke the hive pretty well and smoke the frame good and hope that that does. Or I like to spray them a little bit, and then that helps keep them uh, from flying out. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Over to Henry. Go ahead, Henry. Hey, Don. Um, it's something you said earlier just got me thinking. Do you have? Do you know if any or any of your students do both uh, uh, sell bees and sell honey? Yeah, a lot of them do. The other? I mean, try to do one thing or two things and do it well. If yeah. you try to get into pollinate, selling honey and making splits and selling queens, you're going to be sitting at the farmer's market when you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs, you're thinking, how many queens I got coming out? Uh, <laughs> and another thing that most people don't tell you about, swarms. I see people that put the box under a limb and bump them down in there. I have never done that. I'll cut the limb. I'll shake them in front of a nuke box. Now, you can put in a five-frame nuke box, put four frames of new foundation and one frame of honey. That's all you need. And then shake the limb in front and just wait until you get a couple dozen bees that's starting to climb up and move into the box. And then I like to move it six to ten inches away. And wherever you got the clump of bees and then you keep moving the hive, the bees look like a train. They start thinning down in a long line and they'll march in the hive. And... Most people don't even know a swarm in the springtime is going to have more than one queen. And a lot of times they have 20, 30 queens in them. I videotaped several of them out here. And they don't kill each other hanging in a swarm. They only kill each other when they get into a hive and take possession of the hive, then the strongest one. But if you put them in a separate cages, that's a good way to make a lot of splits really fast. Yeah. Not a lot of not a books that I've read or, or seen even talk about that. They just talk about putting the swarm in a box. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, none, uh, none of the, the YouTubers or anything else will, will talk about having multiple queens. Well, when people come here and I try to tell them, what I try to teach you is what is not in books. Because you can read the books and you can teach me what's in the books. I'm going to tell you my experiences, what works and what don't work, and how you can, you know, tweak it to make it work for you. Yeah. yeah. Now, I was thinking I would like to do both uh, honey and, and bees, but... Then you've got to build numbers, a lot of numbers. Okay, okay. Uh, now, should you separate, like, have, have a yard of, of, of what you're doing with honey and have a different yard for your bees? Not necessarily. Okay. I run a lot of hives here, and I've had people that that teach, you know, in colleges, they want, the first thing they say, you'll never make any honey, got too many hives. You know, and I tell them, I, I make honey. I mean, you know, if bees are healthy, they're going to make honey. Right. Right. All right. Thank you. Okay. okay. Over to Ernest. Uh, hold on. Still muted. <laughs> Yeah, do it on your end, it looks like. Try unmuting you. Yeah, it's not letting me do it. Let's... There you go. Okay, now we got it. <laughs> uh, yeah, Don, uh, I was going to use just uh, about three-quarter inch strips uh, this year instead of using full sheets of, uh, of wax. Uh, you think that would work uh, uh, without having uh, one full sheet all the way down? You think y'all draw it down uh, just off of that uh, well, three quarter inch? The, I, di I didn't explain that to you when you come, the, the, the good and the bad about it, right? Uh, you probably did, but I probably forgot. All right. If this is the frame and you got a one inch starter strip here, and then this is down to the bottom. There's nothing here, is there? Right. If you've got foundation down here, even the embossing, the queen can lay in it and they'll draw it out. But if you don't have nothing but a starter ship, they have to wait until it's drawn down. So that's the thing I explained to students. 
You can put starter strips in there. It's going to take a lot of sugar to draw it down, but it's the thing to get you down the road faster. A full sheet in there will get you down the road about two weeks quicker. Because if the bees ain't drawn out, you don't have warm enough weather or you're not feeding them enough, they're not going to draw the wax. And then if, by having foundation in there, you already have an imprint of what they're going to draw. You have a better chance. I had a fellow I talked to a couple days ago, and he said, I'm getting all kind of crisscrossing there. And after talking to him, he's running a 10-frame box with nine frames in it. And then just by talking to him for a few minutes, he said he ate up all the time with hive beetles. And then he said something, and I caught it right away. I said, well, you got spacers in there. Use your fingers. The spacers, or the metal rabbits, they call them, that the frames sit on, there's places where uh, critters get up in there. Wax moth eggs, high beetles, you're creating places for them to live. Number one reason I got rid of uh, inner covers. I mean, if you're going to use an inner cover, put it on in the wintertime and put a sugar board on top of it. I mean... Everybody's got a different idea of what works and what don't work. Well, I found out what didn't work. Uh, I made, <laughs> I made uh, uh, some splits late and I uh, didn't get them built up enough and they didn't have enough cluster. And uh, we had that Arctic blast and uh, uh, they were single. Uh, uh, me, I had some mediums and had some deep but they, they were just saying they wasn't doubled. And I lost about every one of those. I got one of them, I think, is still living. Uh, had food on them, you know, it wasn't it, they didn't have food on them, but the cluster was so small, they couldn't keep herself warm, so. Clusters, you know, I mean, I've seen clusters the size of your fist. Uh, a grapefruit, an orange, I've seen it going in January that size and come, coming out like gangbusters in the springtime. Sometimes you can get the size of a basketball and they die. I don't know if they're not uh, creating enough heating there or if they starve, but I've seen myself here, small ones, I would just gave up, I would just let them go. If they're gonna make it, they make it, and they make it. Uh, sometimes it's, it's moisture in there. You might not think you're getting moisture, but you know, that's why I hold back dipping boxes. I think by dipping a box, um, you make it waterproof inside, outside. The box sweats. I don't. I, I never did care for that myself. I believe if the inside is standard, it'll help wick away some of the moisture. Yeah. Well, that's. Uh, I had some of them. I think was moisture in them, uh, uh, but. Yet they were vented and had the uh, hot top feeders on there, but we had an awful lot of rain and uh, blowing rain, and uh, it's been a bad know, year. Never had time to dry out, you know. Yeah. Even uh, with all their fanning and whatever they do, mm -hmm. you might try putting a, a vent hole in the front of your box and in the back too. Yeah, well, I got it under uh, uh, all my new boxes. I got it under the hand hole front yeah. and back. Yeah. I think uh, it helps. Each year I'm uh, trying to improve a little bit. So yeah. hopefully we'll get to the point where we don't. Uh, well, last year I, I think I only lost uh, two or three. But this year I, I lost several of them. Uh, but it's my fault, you know, not having them build up and having them in a single box. I would say, you know, a small cluster, you know, you might not have treated them enough with uh, the treatments in the fall. I think that's the biggest thing, and people blame it on moisture in some time, but um, bees, if they are wet looking or moldy looking, then you know it's moisture, but when you got dry bees on the bottom board there, sometimes it's just plain, you know, moisture in there. Well, I had some fondant, too. It was, uh, I don't think it's made right. It uh, turned liquidy and went down through the highs, and I lost a few of them that way. So. That sounds like moisture rising up. Yeah, I have never uh, ever used that fondant myself. What I always did was put a newspaper and then just put the sugar dry, heap it up a little bit, and just make sure your lid goes down good on the box. You might have to move it. The moisture coming up will, will wet that down enough. They'll use it. Well, some of my other bees is taking the sugar and hauling it out of the hive. Uh, <laughs> they don't even want it. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. I mean... That'll happen when you drop dry sugar down the back because we've done that, you know, 
and on hives that was low on feed. Well, the other ones that I guess they got enough moisture in it that kind of crystallized up and they were eating that. Mm -hmm. So, they're living and learning. That's a good thing about a chat. That's why, you know, it's good to get on there and talk about what you have a problem with and, and listen to what other people's having and, and you can put things together and hopefully save bees. Well, I got to write all this down so next year I'll know <laughs> not to, what to do and what not to do. When it gets into your pocket, you remember it a lot better, believe me. <laughs> right. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Okay. Over to Dennis. Go ahead, Dennis. I don't know if Ernest this applies or not. But can't can't hear you, Dennis. How about now? That works yeah. better. <laughs> yeah, I'll put the mic down on my mouth. I don't know <laughs> if it applies to you or not, Ernest. I've never kept in five frame nukes until I seen some of Don's videos. And first year I lost a bunch of them. And I really believe my mistake was I was concerned for them having enough honey in there. I didn't let them get enough nurse bees, and it wasn't too long. I lost them late in the winter. Now I, I rob them, them hives, the frames, and let them draw out their babies and feed them the sugar if I have to. But this year I haven't lost but one. That fell over and got rained on. But I don't know if that's what it was or not. But I was letting them fill up nice and heavy, thought I was doing good. But. No, I cost them their brood is what I did. Well, that's that's another thing, too. You know, people think they got to be fed all the time and got to have, you know, a lot of honey. I've seen them with too much honey in there and not enough brood. That's where I was. If the, if the cluster gets too small and you don't have enough new bees, these bees that's in there are getting old every day. So the life expectancy is going to, you know, get shorter and shorter. Yeah. And if you don't have new ones hatching out, because bees are going to – the queen is going to lay year round. I don't care where you live. Some places she lays a lot more, but even in Ohio, you're going to have a cluster there. I've opened up hives in Ohio and had a four and five inch cluster, you know, on three frames. So they do lay. And, yeah. you know, I've had people in bee clubs say, oh, the queen shuts down and don't lay at all. It, that's not nature. Nature is going to replace itself one way or the other. Well, I'm up here in the north central. We're about to have another snowstorm tonight. And I opened up today. We got up 50 something today. I wanted to double check. And I got some of them's got one frame of brood. I'm going to have to keep an eye on them. They think spring's here, whether the temperature is or not. They're ready to take off. I'm ready for them, too. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Thank you. You don't want to get going too quick. No, but warm weather. Get me out of that basement. I've built enough boxes and. Brother had enough sawdust in my lungs. I need to get outside for a while. <laughs> you need to get your wax mill and start making wax. <laughs> well, that's on my list, but <laughs> but that's in the future. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay. Okay. Over to Anthony. Go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, when Ernest was saying uh, his bees had taken the sugar out of the hive. Oh, it's probably three weeks or so ago now. I looked under mine. You know, mine's got them, uh, you know, Joe May beetle traps in there, that little ball jars screwed in the bottom. And I said, geez, the, the jars look like they're like half full or more. So what the hell is that? You know, I unscrewed the thing. My bees are taking the sugar and putting it out down in the, in the, in the beetle trap. <laughs> and, and I didn't spill any down the back of the hive or anything because I put it on a little four-inch paper plate, you know. And uh, that they, they were, uh, all three of them were like half full of sugar. So I guess they didn't need it. And uh, for Bruce there, yeah, uh, I say thanks again to Pat for putting me in connection with Dr. Sammy and uh I'm really looking forward to spending a little time with him and learn as much as I can from that guy when he gets here in June. So, uh, in my, if you ask my wife if she likes the bees, she goes, no, but she <laughs> likes the bees. She likes playing with the bees. I catch her out there peeking under the covers sometime. And when I say, come on, I want you to come with me. I'm going to go check the bees. She's happy to go. So she'll be happy to go and, and do the translating and whatever. So, I hope it works out well for me and him. Okay, that's all I got for now. 
Okay, uh, I got two questions from the web page. So uh, Tommy wants to know if you have one double medium eight frame colony, what is a reasonable expectation of how many hives the bees could make going into winter? Well, it depends on, you know, if all the frames are full of brood and how much honey and if you're feeding them and, and the location, there's a lot of variables there. But now if he's asking how many splits could you make on mediums, if he's got two boxes, you know, eight frame box, that's 16 frames. You can make a minimum of four or five, not even hurt that box. And Tony has a question. He says, I'm in Michigan and I have a nuke coming. Can I also order a package, take a frame of comb from nuke and give it to hive with packaged bees? Also, do I need to separate the two hives, one a nuke and one a package? Not really. I mean, you just set them, you could set them basically side by side, but you don't even have to do anything with a package. I mean, take that one nuke, that one frame out of the nuke, set it in there, make sure you don't have a queen on it. And if it's sitting side by side, the oldest bees will fly back to the parent hive and the new bees are going to accept the package queen. Okay. And that is it for tonight. Uh, we're at just over nine o'clock, it looks like. So thank you, Don. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. And if you want to stick around for the uh, open after chat, you're more than welcome to. Everybody will have their questions then. Of course they will. <laughs> All right, we're done recording.